Welcome to the Money Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Clay Fink. And on today's show, I'm joined by Max Rudolph. Max, pleasure having you on the show. Well, thanks, Clay. I, I want to thank you for inviting me on the podcast. I've been a TIP listener for a lot of years and enjoy these new offerings as well and have, have enjoyed some of the millennial podcasts that you've been doing. Thank you, Max. As I mentioned in the intro, your background is working with insurers. I had met you a couple of times previously <laughs> during my previous work in the insurance field. And as an actuary, you know as much about risk management about as anyone else I know in the investment industry or just anyone else out there that is investing. What are some of the things you learned in that environment that you've applied to your own investment framework? Yeah. And, and thanks for the kind words. I've spent a lot of years working with insurers and institutional investors, looking at it from a risk management standpoint. A lot of times, actuaries tend to look at things from the liability side of the balance sheet. So bringing that investment knowledge comes in handy. But along with that investment knowledge in the CFA charter, I have to remind people that anything I say today is not investment advice. Although I think we will maybe talk about a couple of companies, we'll, we'll focus more on the process. But the main things that I've learned over the years are things that you know, if somebody knows a lot about investments, it's not going to be surprising. It's beating the drum of value investing, beating the drum of risk management. So things like uh, avoiding leverage. You know, if we've been in a bull market for 15 years, and a lot of that was due to stimulus, things that weren't natural to the supply demand world. And I, and I think we'll come back to that a little bit later. But you know, if you've been buying with using leverage and levering up. That can be a problem over time. That's that's one of the things that I've avoided over years. I'd rather get rich slow and stay rich than get rich fast and end up, you know, and, and you hear stories like that from you know hundred years ago of people who that happened to, you know, that end up in the streets and die alone. You know, as Keynes so famously said, markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And that's a good quote to live by. And we've had these low rates and, and a lot of that has been artificial, but it, it drives these imbalances. If you're buying a mortgage, buying a house and getting a mortgage, whether rates are at 2% or 3.5% probably doesn't matter in terms of whether you buy the house or not. But if you're a hedge fund and you can get rates of 2% or half a percent, you know, you're off to the races. And I think we're, we're starting to see with the market correction recently that some of those hedge funds and other investors that have either leveraged or been very aggressive with their investment strategy, they're starting to pay the price a little bit and really haven't thought ahead as much as they should have. So coming at it from an insurance perspective where the money is really coming from policyholders, my belief and working at an insurance company as well was always in win-win scenarios that how can I take the side of the policyholder? How can you do right by the customer and still make a nice profit? I think there's room to do that along with uh, maintaining a, a risk profile that's within your risk appetite and consistent with everything that allows you to sleep at night. That's you know really the driver. If you're not sleeping at night because of your investments, you're being too aggressive, you need to take a step back. And so I really encourage people to take control of their own finances. I'll write articles and essays within the actuarial profession. And especially from the pension side, I don't do very well in their contests because my essays always say, take control of your finances, you know, save, invest, and then rinse and repeat, you know, do it again. Don't rely on others where a lot of times what they're looking for is, you know, what can we provide as a service that we can get paid for to somebody else? You know, a lot of things out there, but that's probably the main point that I'll make today is listen to other people, but you know, you've got to have your own strategy and, and have it all make sense in your own head. As I have these interviews with just fantastic investors, I always come back to Morgan Housel's book that I recently read and had an episode on. I'm always fascinated by talking with investors that have a ton of experience like you do. In Housel's book, he talks about the story of Jesse Livermore, of how he bets everything. He made a fortune and ended up losing it all. And that relates directly to what you were saying with having conservative finances and investments and avoiding leverage as well, which is two things that Livermore wasn't too good at. In the first chapter of Housel's book, he talks about how each individual's perception of the world is highly influenced by their experiences. You know, the way I look at the world is probably a lot different than the way you look at the world just because of 
you know, the things we've read, the things we've learned and the experiences we've had. And the experiences piece is a big part of that, I believe. Two people that are very smart might both be in in the investment industry and work in that industry might look at the exact same thing and come to two completely different conclusions on what an investment might look like or what its outlook might be. Could you talk to us about your investment experience over the years and some of the things you've learned as an investor investing your own portfolio? Yeah, maybe I'll I'll comment on your question first, because Howard Marks is somebody like that, that his books and his blogs and things like that are just fantastic. But he personally invests totally different, you know, in in high yield and in stuff that's gone bankrupt in, in totally different types of things than I'm comfortable doing to where the process can be the same or very similar even while you're in totally different markets. So it's kind of interesting. And the, the Hustle book is interesting. I've read that one as well. His skiing story is, is worth the, the price of the book by itself. So I'll, I'll maybe tee that up for people to go out and buy it. But my experience, you know, I, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. You know, my dad was middle class. He moved into management. When I was maybe 10, my parents bought a dividend reinvestment plan with the local utility which was fairly typical at the time to to try to teach your kids about saving and things like that and you know what i found over time was that you know a lot of those drips the fees are just really high and so i'm i'm not personally in in any today but i've i've done a couple over the years and and kind of learned the hard way not to do that but that was really my first experience of investing cuz my dad was a 40 year employee with AT&T so he had a, an ESOP and and so they lived off of their AT&T stock and you know what spun off of that over the years and, and made for a nice retirement for them. But you know, then you don't really get much in high school, at least or in the era that I was at. Hopefully there's a little bit more now. But I did take a class in college. I have a degree in math, but also a degree in business and and used an, an elective on investing, wanted to learn a little bit more about it, you know, but didn't have any money. I mean, I was telling somebody the story the other day that when I was a freshman in college, I had probably three dollars a day that I could spend. And I actually kept track of that because if you spend too much in September, you're going hungry by the time you get to May. So I, I didn't have any personal investment experience. So I got a job out in Omaha, uh, Nebraska here. And then you know, it took me a while to, to even get any money saved up. You know, They added the IRA regulations soon after that. And so I set up an IRA and my timing was just horrible. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I remember I bought IBM and you know, within a week we had the Black Monday where the one day drop of twenty five percent. And so my I think it cost me hundred and forty dollars and you know, within a month it was down to forty. You know, but at the same time it's uh it was a small dollar amount and, and all that. So I, I I didn't get killed. But then I went on, I got my actual credential in ninety four, my CFA credential charter in ninety eight. So at that point everything that I had was pretty much efficient market focus. Where I've learned the uh, value side is from living in Omaha, being exposed to Buffett and other people like him. And early on, you know, I, I remember one company I bought. I bought based on a tip in USA Today, you know, where they were talking about you know investing. And I I still remember when they did their one for ten stock split, which is not how uh, the stock split that you want to see. To where your you know your two dollar investment is now back up to twenty and completely a waste of your time of having invested whatsoever because it's in an IRA so you don't even get to harvest the tax loss but then you know in 88 I had uh, been around long enough you know and decided to buy some Berkshire Hathaway at that point a friend of mine that uh, started about the same time I did had bought some and the investment department at the company I was at was they were talking about it they owned some but I I just couldn't save quickly enough that was a period where it grew very quickly and I think you know, when I was looking to buy it, it was about eight thousand dollars a share of what would you know what's now an A share. And I finally saved up enough in '94 when the company I was at added a bonus plan. And so all of a sudden, I had this dump of money in you know February March time frame, and immediately went out and bought a share. And again, you know, you had three days before it clears, and before it cleared, it it fell from sixteen thousand to fifteen thousand. So it fell six percent before I'd even paid for it. And so you know, this was all really good education you know, when you're young. And obviously, I mean, I still own that share. So it's it's worked out just fine in the long run. But, you know, when you lose money early, you know, at, at your age, trying different things makes a lot of sense, you know, in, in terms of what works, what doesn't work, what do you become comfortable with? Because it's education. When you're at my age and you make a big mistake, 
you know, it's life changing. You know, somebody who is a hundred percent in one hedge fund and it goes belly up, they lose everything. You know, then all of a sudden they're relying on social security for their entire retirement income. And and then they end up having to work until they're 70 or until they die. And that's really sad. So that's why you want to have people listen to your podcast so that they can learn and get better at doing what they're doing. So that's why I would go with that is try different things when you're young and get into a really that process of recurring saving and investing and not buying in and out every other day that you may be the half a percent of the world that would be good at that, but chances are you're not. I'm not. Yeah, I really like that point where when you're young, you know, that's the time to start learning and learn from your mistakes and adjust with, you know, learning from that. I think the last couple of years is just like a prime example of that. I think there are so many lessons with the roller coaster ride and crypto and growth stocks that trees can't go to the sky is the saying they'll say. So uh, it's just a good humbling reminder to learn from those experiences. You know, losing money and investing is just, I think Bill Miller calls it paying tuition to the market. You know, the tuition is pretty expensive at times, but, uh, you know, you can either quit and just give up or you can learn from that experience. Now, as an actuary, you're a person who analyzes and understands risks, like I said, as well as anybody. I'm curious, as someone who understands risk, how you view a portfolio of individual stocks versus, say, owning an index fund like the S&P 500. Can a portfolio of, say, 10 stocks, for example, be much less riskier than simply owning the S&P 500? What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, where you get more comfortable with your personal strategy. I mean, you, you read the books about value investing and a lot of them, if they focus on Buffett, there's a lot of concentration. You, know, you got to be concentrated. And I'm not comfortable with that. You know, I'm, yeah, my best idea is probably better than my 200 best. That's for sure. And, and I have our portfolio right now has over 50 individual companies and, and that's more than I'm comfortable with. With I, I'd prefer to have fewer, but you know, as we went through the last ten years, it was hard to add to certain positions because I didn't think they were buys, and so I end up having to bring in. My first choice is always to add to a position I already have, but if there's nothing there or there's a certain sector that I want to move into, then you end up adding new. And because we're still in in our work lifetime, you know, we're continually adding assets to the mix. So we're not having to sell things to live off of. That'll be interesting as we move to retirement here over the next few years and trying to uh, to just see how we develop a selling strategy. But you know, back to your original question about concentration versus S&P versus index funds, really. I mean, you have to balance that, that risk and return and your concentration is going to add to your volatility. So you got to think about the sleep at night factor. If I only have 10 companies even there, those 10 companies, if they're all tech or they're all defense or they're all oil, they're not really diversified. So, you know, and putting a company like Berkshire in there brings you a lot of diversification because they're in so many different sectors and they're a large cap, but they're really a whole bunch of smaller companies inside of there as well to where that, that helps. But you know, I'm not as worried about the diversification benefits from 10 versus 50. But qualitatively, that gets into my thought process too. Um, may I tend to think about from a marginal standpoint, what is adding this next thing? Does it offset some risks that are already in the portfolio? Is it just a naked bet on something? I, I don't do a lot of that. But you know, at the same time, I mean, a couple of years ago, I decided I wanted to have a, a position in defense stocks. But I didn't. I wasn't an expert in defense stocks, so I pulled up and kind of made a a little you know watch list. And then over the next six months, as I was putting money to work, you know, I'd just say, well, which company is most undervalued at this point in time when I have money? And so I ended up developing uh, probably half a dozen companies in the defense industry, and the timing on that was pretty good. And on top of that, I included because I anticipated. A war, a bigger war than what we're seeing with Russia and Ukraine. I included uh, fossil fuels in that defense sector. And so I have a, a couple of fossil fuel companies in there. And of course, those have done really well, but it takes a lot of patience to hold those, you know, at the time where they were down 75% from when I bought them. And I held them and held them. And now they have a nice profit. And of course, they pay a, a nice dividend as well. But you're always looking for, how to 
do that purchase or how to do that sale? What's your process? My process for sales isn't very good. I have not been very good at it. My process works better for purchases. And then I tend to buy and hold unless the story changes. If something gets extremely overvalued, I might lighten up on a position, but I rarely, unless the story changes, will I sell out of the entire position. I have uh, several things that I've done that with uh, in the RV industry in particular, where it grew and grew and grew. And it's like, well, I'm not really, you know, this is a micro cap company that's now like my third biggest position. I think I'm more comfortable pulling back on things like that. So it ends up being a form of dollar cost averaging where you invest in, in the cheapest of a group of companies when you have cash. And one of the things that I'll point out that I wish 401ks would do is that when a 401k, when the mutual funds or ETFs within a 401k, when they pay money, they automatically reinvest in the same fund. I wish that they would put that in as new cash, is the cash would come out and it'd be just like you, know, you were withholding another chunk out of your paycheck and it would invest based on your new current asset allocation. Because it ends up if you've it's it's kind of a natural way. And so I do that with our personal portfolio that when we get dividends, that just goes in the pot with cash. It doesn't automatically go back into that same sector and certainly not into that same company. But in terms of 10 versus the index, I've written some essays about the problems of index fund investing that you know, I think we're gonna pull some of those and, and put them in the notes for this podcast that people can just read on their own. But yeah, you know, I'm a little bit worried about indexing in the future. If it's like any other idea, if just a few people are doing it, it works great. But once everybody does it, it worked great when the Fed was stimulating and when the treasury was pumping money into the system. But as that gets unwound, the same thing's going to happen in, in reverse. And I think that the index funds will just naturally go down through no fault of their own the same time they went up through no fault of their own. I think that's a good transition to talk about some of the risks in today's market. You mentioned how you know many people just simply invest in index funds and really don't even look at individual stocks. They just continually just buy the index, don't even worry about what the price is. And that's worked over the last decade. And you know, you're very familiar with enterprise risk management. So you're pretty aware of what's kind of going on in the markets, how markets work. Are there any big risks you think investors are potentially underestimating in today's market? Especially with, you know, things are changing rapidly. You know, you mentioned the Fed unwinding its balance sheet and inflation's running hot. So I'm curious if you believe there are any risks out there that investors are underestimating. Yeah, there's a few. And I always seem to be early. So I've been talking about these. You know, I think you're going to refer back to one of my, uh, I do an annual financial predictions. And, you know, some of these things that I'm going to talk about here, I've been talking about probably since 2000, probably for 10 years, things that, I always tend to be early. I kind of see the future based on what we're doing today. And so I try to prepare for that future, but it's hard because markets are efficient. You know, so whatever's today is the same thing. You know, I've heard, uh, you know, even on the investors podcast, I think Preston has talked about how he doesn't understand why Berkshire isn't fully allocated all the time, why it keeps cash. And, and it's like, well, because you can end up better down the road if you hold cash today and then, you know, engage it tomorrow. <laughs> To where it, everybody has a little bit different thought. And even within enterprise risk management, I've had some discussions just in the last couple of days with other people about you know how our definitions of VRM are different. I mean, I look at it as this is, is your aggregate and you're looking at everything, you're rolling everything up and you're looking at interactions between the different risks. You're not just looking at your silo risks, you're looking at how you know, maybe credit risk interacts with your interest rate risk type of a thing, you know, and getting that over onto the liability side within the uh, insurance industry. But yeah, the market was positioned for a fall before the pandemic. Remember at that point, we were talking about there was like the longest running bull market in history. It was like over 10 years long. And then immediately we jumped in with all the stimulus, which was important to do, you know, from a Main Street standpoint, but it really continued to mess with the markets. The markets, it was kind of that too big to fail, but for everybody. And we're going to pay for that going forward. And we're starting to pay for that even today. I, I think the the stimulus that was added in 2020 made sense, but the stimulus that was added in 2018 with the tax reduction bill, that was a real problem. And that 
teed up a lot of what we're going through today. We're not seeing people talk about that yet, but we need to look at this from a fiscal standpoint more so than just talking about it from a monetary policy standpoint. You may be familiar with the book Signal and the Noise, you know, with uh, Silver's book. And it's really interesting. And the way I interpret that for the situation we're in is that fiscal policy is actually the signal. That's what matters. That's what drives your trends. The monetary policy is the noise. It's, it's the cycles. You, know, you go in, you go out. And the problem is that the fiscal policy is what's important, but that gets passed by Congress. And Congress has totally abdicated any involvement in the economy. They essentially say, well, we can spend more, we can spend more, but that doesn't work in the long run. You know, we've gone from debt to GDP of 60% to debt to GDP, I think is up 120 or 130% today. You know, every time I do a talk down at Nebraska, you know, to the practicum class of seniors, that's one stat I have to look up because it changes every year and, and it never goes down. But the further we go away from that 60% debt to GDP, the more assured we are that at some point things will blow up. You know What will trigger it and how far it can go, the timing is, there's no consistent timing. I can't say, oh, it's going to happen here, or here, or here, but we will need at some point to either collect more taxes or to spend less. And so much of the spending goes to automatic spending like social security that it's, it's really hard to address that side. So the problem is on the, the fiscal policy, there's there's no short-term downside to having that punch pull out and, and putting more alcohol in it. You know, and the party goes on and on. And you know, the longer the party goes on, the more we reelect these guys and ladies to Congress, where at least on the monetary policy side, they recognize the importance of getting it right. That you know, they know we need to get back to a, let's say, a three percent. Fed funds rate, and they're working. You know whether they do it you know, regularly or whether they have a surprise somewhere along the way, they'll get there. But you know, I, I think I wrote several years ago. Boy, if the Fed can keep interest rates and inflation down below fifteen percent, they'll have done a wonderful job. And and I still think that's true. I, I think you know one of the asset classes I became aware of just in the last year were those I bonds. I wasn't aware that those were out there. And Jason Zweig wrote them up in the journal and, and I started looking into them. It's like, oh, this is a no-brainer. You go, well, what sectors would you buy right now? And it's, you know, that's the one that that's the obvious one. Everything else, the the risks are really high. But one of the things people don't talk about about the I bonds is that, yeah, we're in a, I would argue, a stagflation environment right now, but as the Fed raises rates, you know, interest rates will come back down and the demographics of the United States and of the world, really of the developed part of the world is such that it's going to continue to pull down on interest rates. And those I bonds have a floor of zero. They go with CPI, but if CPI is negative, you don't, they don't take any away from you. So there's a benefit if you're in a high inflation environment, and there's a benefit if you're in a deflationary environment, which is kind of interesting. And right now, nobody's worried about that. But I think in the long run, there'll be some discussion about that. So I think the, you know, the mistakes that, that people make are being too concentrated in one thing. You know, that's the, the risk management side of it. You know, they end up being all in you know, one sector or one company or, or one asset class, or else it's leverage. You know, there's an awful lot of people buying on margin and you shouldn't use margin until you've lived through a credit cycle. Once you've lived through a credit cycle, then you're going to recognize, I think a little bit better that there's a risk there, that it's not just free money. You know, it's kind of like uh, beta on the cap M, which I'm, I'm not a big cap M fan, but you can take beta all day when the market's going up and do great and it looks great. But as soon as the market starts to come down, you know that overperformance when it goes up means underperformance when you're going down. So I think you've still got, you know, from a risk standpoint, you've got other issues out there. You've got climate change being a threat multiplier to almost any, everything. You know, it makes other risks worse. So you know, climate makes you more likely to have regional conflict. The entire Middle East is becoming unlivable at some point, and you know, as you have sea level rise, you've got a billion people in Bangladesh that live below like two feet of sea level. Whereas that, as that comes up naturally over the next 20 years, where are they going to go? 
you know, immigration policy is going to be huge and, and everybody just says, no, I don't want them. But we're the ones who created this problem and we need to be, be part of the solution. You know, the, these are all going to have negative impacts on economic growth and eventually that flows through markets. You mentioned your predictions and I'd like to pull the thread on one that you mentioned there. You said that, you know, if monetary policy gets too extreme, then things might really break. And in one of your predictions, you mentioned a potential currency default of the US dollar and how MMT is not the answer to the US's debt problem. This reminds me of Ray Dalio's work on the long-term debt cycle. Um, it's something we at TIP <clears throat> study and talk about a good amount. And my question is, why is there no mention of gold or some sort of alternative currency or alternative system in your writings? You know, Wouldn't this be the time to buy something like gold if there is some sort of currency default? Hey guys, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Trade Coffee for supporting the Investors Podcast Network. I've always had trouble finding fresh coffee at the grocery store because a lot of the time it has been sitting on the shelves for weeks and eventually goes stale. Trade Coffee sells the freshest roasted and ethically sourced beans from America's best local roasters. They deliver right to your doorstep with free shipping as often as you'd like. I got started with Trade by taking their simple quiz online. It was super easy as they asked me a few questions such as how I make my coffee, whether I'm a coffee expert or beginner, and if I add milk or cream to my coffee. The results matched me with the Nebula Dark Roast. And let me tell you guys, I cannot get enough of it. It was roasted right here in the US in Oakland, California, and it has a comforting and rich taste with added honey to help me satisfy my sweet tooth. Another reason I love Trade is because they support small businesses and ensure they're sourcing their beans from sustainable sources. Trade has delivered over 5 million bags of fresh coffee, and they have more than 750,000 positive reviews. If that isn't enough for you, Trade literally guarantees you'll love your first bag too, or they'll replace it for free. Right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order, plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP, or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking their quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let trade find you a coffee you'll love. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off your first order. Yeah, gold is one of those asset classes that I'll readily admit that I don't understand why gold has value either. I mean, when people come back and say, when you have the crypto discussion, you always end up back in gold, but gold has historically been a store of value. You know, if you go back into colonial times, you know, Spain and the other countries that were bringing gold back from the new world, that was their natural growth of their economic system to where it, it does matter. I've actually taken a small position in a gold miner to try to learn more, but it, it certainly hasn't paid off for me at this point. I, I still think it may. I think that the fact that crypto is out there is taking some of the people who would have invested in gold and taking that money over to the crypto side. And the fact that crypto is, is going down and so is gold tells me it's not coming back right now. So it's, it's a very confusing asset class to me. It's one that I, you know, my gut still tells me that gold is going to take off at some point, but my money is not where my mouth is. And I like assets that have a return to them that I can value using a discounted cash flow method. I'm much more comfortable with that. And again, I guess it comes back somewhat to the, you know, do what you're comfortable, do what lets you sleep at night. You know, I don't feel like crypto is taking away the real economy. So I don't think those are going away. So I'm I'm comfortable just sticking with what I do. But I always wish everybody else luck. I, I'd say I hope it works out for you. And if it does, then you can explain to me why you're so much more brilliant than I am. Yeah. You know, stick with what you know. That's a ton of investors do, you know, just look at Buffett. Yeah. A bit earlier, you mentioned that, you know, you live in Omaha. Buffett's had an influence on you as an investor. And I'd love to dive into the Buffettology side of the conversation. Could you talk a little bit more about how Buffett has influenced you over the years? You know, you've been in Omaha for a really long time. You've watched him evolve as an investor. I'm sure you've studied many of the books that have been written about him. So 
I'd love for you to expand on some of the things you've learned from him. Yeah. Warren Buffett's been a, a big influence on my life, not because I have lunch with him on a regular basis. I think I I can't even remember whether I shook his hand the one time when he and Catherine Graham were signing uh, her book one year at one of the annual meetings. But once you start to follow him and you you kind of keep track of what he's doing and look for the nuances in what's changing, he's not a stable investor. I mean, at, at one time he was doing dead arbitrage and, and stuff like that. And you hear some stories from back in the 50s and 60s of some of the things that he was doing, but he's evolved over time. But his underlying process of looking for undervalued things and being patient and, and all that has been consistent across all of time. So for me, it was it's a great learning experience even now, you know, because my background really pushed the efficient markets and cap M and, and all that from the, you know, from university, from actuarial credentialing, and even from, you know, CFA does does broader than that. And it introduces you to some of the value tools. But you know, watching Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger over the years helped me to to kind of compare and contrast and get to a place that I was comfortable with. And I'm much closer to them today than I am to the uh, efficient market theory. You know, and so building off of those efficient market tools to add that qualitative view of the company, to try to work your filters so that you're doing both a quantitative and a qualitative, looking at the margin of safety. If things work out, you do great. If things don't work out, you still do okay. You know That's useful for me. I'm not trying to hit home runs all the time. As long as I'm continually you know, hitting singles and doubles, some of those home runs happen naturally. And you know, Berkshire's one of them. I mean, I've got a, what, a 20 bagger out of that you know, over my lifetime. So it's, it's been nice. But you know, developing my own interpretation of kind of that rising and falling tide Buffett's famous for his comment, you don't know, you know who's been swimming naked until the tide goes out. And, and it's, you know, when you're talking to a non-investor, that can be a very good analogy because they, they understand that, that you know, when the tide's rising, all the boats are rising with it. But when the tide starts to fall, when, when markets are moving against you, you know, if somebody doesn't have a swimsuit on, they're highly embarrassed at that point. And, and that's worked well for me. A lot of times people I've worked with over the years, they'll ask me to speak to you know, somebody who's just coming out of college or somebody who's you know, a couple of years into their career. And I always in- encourage them to buy a single B share of Berkshire because it gets them into the annual meeting every year. And then once you own something, you know, the whole behavioral finance side, you tend to, you know, you're an owner now, so it's important to you and you track what those people say. And I think it it can become really cheap education for somebody to do that. And you know, there's there's other companies out there too that I, I think uh, people have reading the blogs have, have been really really effective. I mean, I, I like Howard Marks's blog. It, I don't pay for any blogs, um, but there's enough free ones out there that that are really interesting. You mentioned a bit earlier that you decided to purchase Berkshire back in 1988, and if I'm doing my math right, that's 34 years ago, and I'm just so curious how Buffett was viewed back then. You know, was he a well-known guy in Omaha? Was he this guy that's one of the richest people in the city and, you know, everyone knows who he is or did he kind of fly under the radar? Well, I think during the 50s and 60s he did fly under the radar a bit. There was uh, his group of core investors that were they knew his dad or or they knew his wife's dad who you know, was active in the community. And there was a group of them of doctors that funded it. And a lot of the local hospitals now in the area are, are named for those doctors because they stuck with them over the years. But I moved here in 1983. And that was the year that they bought the Nebraska Furniture Mart from um, the Blumkin family. And of course, you know, Rose was well known as, you know, working till she was 103. And I mean, she didn't die on the floor of the Furniture Mart or anything like that, but it, it was close to that. And Buffett, uses that a lot of times in the annual letters to make a joke about why it's not a big deal that he's 90 years old and still working because he, he learned from the best. But his reputation was good at that time and becoming better known. Since I was working in an insurance company and starting to talk to the investment folks there, I, I was aware of him. One of the things that's interesting in reading some of the, the bios, especially the Alice Schroeder 
Snowball bio was his role along with his wife, Susie, in Omaha in terms of some of the discrimination and things like that and trying to make things better for, for communities that weren't favored. And that's he's continued to do that. I mean, he does the girls club here in Omaha and uh, you know, they're just in the process of doing the last luncheon, you know, with uh, Glide out in San Francisco, which was his, one of his wife's favorite charities. And so, yeah, he was well known and and obviously now you know he's very well known but you know one of the interesting things that came out somebody did the calculation and you know it's like 99 percent of his wealth came about after he turned 65 or i can't remember the exact number but it's just phenomenal the the growth that 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 investment you know just that whole conglomerate has had since then and and really they just they work off of the same process you know, he's the chief capital allocator. That's the role that I worry about in succession. You know, he's got a couple of really good investors in there. He's got operations guys. You know, he's got Ajit Jain on the on the insurance side and getting Todd Combs involved on that now. And now bringing in uh, Joe Brandon back into the fold with the new acquisition here just recently of Allegheny. You know, there's a group there, but the person who's sitting at the top that's deciding, okay, I've got 20 different groups coming to me asking for money. Which one do I give it to? That's the role that I worry about a little bit with Berkshire because you I mean he's the best at doing that. You can't find somebody and just replace that. So that'll be interesting going forward to see how that plays out. But yeah, they've got a great team and I expect it to continue to to do well. I fully expect that most of my shares, if not all, you know, we'll go through the estate planning process. Yeah. You know, it's one of those companies you can definitely feel confident holding for a very long time period, especially like you mentioned earlier, just how diversified it is. And uh, I like to dig a little bit into the holdings that Buffett has. It really interested me that he added to his Apple position, you know, just looking at the valuation <laughs> from say 2015 to now, it's like, yeah, he bet big in 20, I believe it was 2016, actually. He bet big in 2016, and he's still adding that position despite the multiple expansion. So I was really interested to see that. It wasn't a lot he added. It was like $600 million, if I remember right. And then I went to the meeting and was also somewhat surprised to see him allocate over $40 billion towards the energy sector, specifically Chevron and <laughs> Occidental Petroleum were two of those names that he added to. And during our conversation beforehand, you mentioned that you actually own Chevron. So I'm curious what your general thoughts are on what Buffett might be seeing in this pick. I've gone in and out of oil stocks a number of times. And each time I do, it's kind of like Buffett is with uh, airline stocks. You know, he, he keeps getting pulled back in and it never works out and he wears off them and then eventually he comes back. I'm kind of like that with energy stocks. I own both Chevron and Phillips and I was looking for. It's part of that defense sector allocation that I talked about earlier, that if we have a, a major war, it'll run on fossil fuels. And the fact that Chevron has a lot of uh, North American, that's where their resources are. They're not pulling things from the Middle East and, and other areas that they might get turned off, that where the taps might get turned off. He added substantially to that position since Russia invaded Ukraine. What's not clear to me is why he didn't do something a year ago, you know, because I got in and like I mentioned earlier, I mean, it was down for most of the time, but it had already come back up and was already ahead of where I had bought it when he started buying in again. So it's not quite clear why he did it when he did or what he's looking for. I mean, like when he bought the Verizon, my interpretation was that it was a holding pattern that he was looking for the dividend. Chevron pays a really nice dividend. So it, there could be something tied to that as well. Now, on the other side, you've got the whole ESG side. And I've actually done some research on climate and done some writings on ESG, you know, some papers and, and articles on TCFD, the task force on climate-related financial disclosures. And I guess I'd like to talk about that a little bit because you know, Chevron ties in with that so well. And it's interesting because when you go to the TCFD folks, they talk about a company being yes or no, the worst thing ever, or they're perfect. And there's a lot of uh, what they call greenwashing going on out there that companies or funds especially will say, oh, well, we're green. And then when you drill down into what they own, you know, it's ExxonMobil and Chevron and all these different fossil fuel companies. But in reality, 
we need to look at at these companies on a spectrum you know and, and berkshire is a great example of that where they now have the the oxy and the chevron big positions but they also are the largest renewable energy source in america and they're building out an electrical grid they're essentially building that wind turbines primarily in the northern part of the country you know iowa they're just trying to add a whole bunch more over there and what they do is then they set up the electrical grid to send that south you know so the Texas or Nevada, or, you know, I assume though, because they have the ownership of the uh, utility in in uh, Northwest, in the Northwest, that they'll have it going down into California as well. So it's you know they're spending over twenty billion dollars on this. I, I'm not sure they're not spending more than the federal government on <laughs> renewable energy, and yet according to the the TCFD guys, they're bad. You know, and it's it, it's just not that easy. So I, I would especially be skeptical of those proclaiming how good they are at ESG. We saw the same thing with enterprise risk management with ERM. The ones who said they were doing all these great things you know, were likely to pretty much need a bailout in 2008. And the ones who kind of quietly just did their job and did a good job, you just never heard about them. So it's, you always need to look a, a couple layers below the surface to see what's going on with that. I had a question just come to mind. You know, one of Buffett's core principles is to invest within your circle of competence. And you've talked a lot about, you know, having a diversified portfolio. So I'm curious how maybe the people listening or something I even struggle with myself is how do you decide whether a company or a sector is even investable given Buffett's principle of, you know, staying within your circle of competence? Yeah, it's one of those that I know for me, there's certain companies and I tend to be a, a Picks and axes kind of guy, you know, where they tell the story about the, in particular, the the Alaskan gold rush, where you are much more likely to make a fortune selling picks and axes to the the miners than you were to actually be a miner. And so, what I'll do is I like to look at companies that you know they're making widgets and then they're sold. Actually, despite the fact that I come from you know an institutional investor background with a job, I don't own any insurance companies except for the part of Berkshire, partly because I just, as an outsider, I can't tell how the cash flows are working or what they're doing. I, and I know enough about the models that they're doing to know that, well, although I wouldn't manipulate the models, I know how to manipulate the models. And I know that means that other people will. And so it's, it's something to be aware of. And again, I've gone down a you know, rabbit hole that's different than what you asked me. So I apologize for that. Yeah. So I essentially just had this struggle of, you know, on the one hand, you have Buffett's core principle of investing within your circle of competence. And on the other hand, you're talking a lot about building a diversified portfolio. So I'm curious how you balance the two when, you know, you analyze a company, you're like, yeah, it looks like a fantastic investment. But do you know enough about the industry? And is it truly within your circle of competence? So I'm curious how you balance those two, you know, ways of investing. Yeah, and for that, I focus less on the diversification. If there's a sector that I don't feel like I understand, I don't invest in it. I'd rather invest in the core things. I look at uh, country investing the same way. You know, I tend to invest in uh, in the United States. You know, my wife has a 401k, and so we use some of her allocation to get some international exposure, and we also use some of her allocation for small caps. But and then I try to stick within things that I'm comfortable with. So I, you know, I started off with the uh, picks and axes type companies, and then I'll add around the edges of that. I'll try to learn something, or I'll take a small position in a company. And, you know, as an example, I was looking in you know 15 years ago at railroads, and I looked at the different railroads that you had access to. And and I thought, you know, I know a little bit about railroads. I think that the sector itself will do well. I'm going to pick one and buy some and then add to it as I go. Well, I picked Burlington Northern, which I bought an initial position and then the price started going up and I couldn't figure out why. And, And as it turned out, it was because Berkshire was buying Burlington Northern to get their initial position and they were pulling the price up. So I never did get to gain the confidence to, to get a bigger position. But that's kind of my strategy is I'll buy a small position. And if as I get more comfortable with it, because once it's in your portfolio, you start following it. 
you know, and, and it's interesting you brought up Apple. I'm kind of the opposite there because I had an Apple position and it's so dominated my news feed that I sold it, not because of valuation, but just because I wasn't able to follow the other companies because 50% of the things in the news feed were about Apple. And, and it, was, it was just driving me nuts. So I sold it and that was right when he started buying. So I ended up gaining the exposure back but I don't have any direct exposure today to Apple. So you know, I try to expand a little bit, but I'm, I feel like I get enough diversification. I'm, I'm not worried about that I'm under diversified at this point, but there, you know, for a long time, I mean, in 98, 99, I mean, I avoided tech stocks and, and that was okay. I remember when I was at the company and they added a, a new growth fund and it was clearly a tech fund. And I remember saying that to somebody and going, this thing's just going to blow up. And it did. And then we go back and, and say, well, you know, I told you this was going to blow up. And they go, no, you didn't. And that's why I started when I went out on my own, started doing these annual financial predictions. Because I think that I can learn from going back and looking and saying, what was I thinking at that time? Was I right? Was I wrong? Because otherwise, you only remember certain things. And what I find is that you tend to remember the choices that worked out. You don't remember you know, the company that you bought that went when you bought level three at its top and, and it went to zero and essentially went bankrupt to where we're very selective. So actually forcing yourself to go back and look at some of those things, I think can be very healthy. One more question related to Buffett. He is <laughs> an extremely avid reader. You know, if you ask Preston or Stig, what's the biggest thing they've learned from these billionaires they've studied? And it's that they are just reading monsters. They just like consume so much information, just always learning. And Buffett's on record for saying that him and Charlie chose his successors because these people were the only people they could find that read more than him and Charlie. And I'm sure you're definitely in the same boat with how knowledgeable you are and how much writing you do. So I'm curious what maybe some of the best books are that you've ever read. Yeah, and I'm glad you're not limiting it to one because there's there's a lot out there. And and actually the book that I'm going to eventually get to isn't really an investment book, but there's a lot of other ones. The Robert Hagstrom books, you know, especially Lattice Work. I really like that one because it talks about the mental models that Munger's always talking about. Now his uh, publisher made him change the name of that with the second edition. So Lattice Work was the the original name. I think it's uh, the last liberal art. I think it's what they called that it after that Lattice Work. It's how I think about it in terms of you know the integration between different things. You know, and it's Robert's very very thought provoking. You know, he comes out here every year. I've I've spoken to him a couple times just at CFA events that they've had here. You know, another one. Um, you know, that's not investment related, but uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. You know, it's a Pulitzer Prize winner, Jared Diamond. But it really comes back. Buffett talks about the ovarian lottery in terms of, you know, he's in the right place at the right time. And, you know, if you come out of reading Guns, Germs, and Steel and, and think you're special and it didn't have anything to do with, you know, being growing up in, in the United States, um, you know, then you need to read it again because it's very true that, you know, we've been very blessed in our background, whether we came from, you know, even if you came from, um, you know, an underclass privileges and things like that, and we're still better off than, than having grown up somewhere else. You know, other authors that I really like, Michael Lewis and Roger Lowenstein are, are just great storytellers. And, you know, anything that they write, I'll pick up and read. But the, the book I'm going to mention is, is called The Box. It's written by a, a historian named Mark Levinson and was recommended by Bill Gates. You know, he Bill Gates has has had for a long time this these emails that he puts out and once or twice a year he throws out books and occasionally one will will be interesting to him. This one sat on my shelf for a long time, but I eventually read it and and it, what it does is it covers the emergence of the standardized shipping container. You know, and those Maersk ship, you know, like when the ship got stuck in the Suez Canal, all those boxes that are on top of it, those used to be just random sizes. And the fact that they standardized it and made it so that no matter which, you know, made it so that it went between uh, auto coverage, you know, to where you would fit on a flatbed or would fit on a ship with the same shipping container. It's just fascinating to follow that for 50 years. And, and this one guy was kind of a driver, but you know, he'd win and then he'd lose and then he'd win again. You know, you know, he's one of those guys that I don't know as he ended up rich, but the consumer ended up way richer than they would have been without him. And the consumer really is the the big winner there. So I like to to kind of throw out these side books. I mean, everybody probably gives you the same three or four, 
and I've read them all. I've got them all here on my on my bookshelves. But there's a lot of good books out there, and you know that whole thought process of lifelong learning is is the key. You know, if you're not going to be a lifelong learner, you're not going to be a good investor. You know, and that comes through reading. It comes through learning about new companies, learning about you know new ways, new processes of doing things. You know, learning, trying to learn a little bit about crypto. It's just a matter of figuring out what works for you and. And like I said at the beginning, taking ownership of your own decisions. I think that's the key. I love it. I'll be sure to link many of those books you mentioned in the show notes as well as some of your writings. I really, really appreciate you joining me today. I know you didn't have to you know, take all this time to educate our audience. So I really, really appreciate that. Before we close out the episode, where can the audience connect with you and follow along with some of the work you're doing? Yeah, and I mean, I don't have a mutual fund that I'm trying to sell. It's it's really Clay. We had met you know over the years and thought we might have a nice discussion. Hopefully, it's been helpful to your listeners for the historical work. I have a, a website at www.rudolph-financial.com. I actually haven't updated it for several years, but I've been putting everything out on uh, LinkedIn and and Twitter since then. I'm at Max Rudolph on Twitter. You know, I find that most of my interesting projects are are those that tie to my stage in life. Um, so I expect that going forward, I'll be writing more about investing in retirement and taking that block of assets that you've accumulated and working on the decumulation stage. And we'll, we'll link to a couple of essays that I've already written, kind of looking at that, building off of some work that Steve Jordan, another actuary out at Stanford has done. But yeah, go back a few years and, and see how well my, my annual predictions have done. I, you know, Really, the goal of those is for me to have something down in writing so I can access them. But hopefully, it also provides some ways of thinking outside the box for some other people too. You know, I put in um, some different scenarios or, or one of the things we could talk about if we decided to do this again would be kind of you know what year is this year like that I like to think in terms of that. And it allows me to like today, I'm trying to learn more about the Gilded Age because I think there's a lot of similarities with today and it's an era I don't know much about. If I see other references to you know 1973 or 1856, which really scares me because you know what followed that. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting things. I mean, I, I talked about pandemics starting in 2004, talked about low rates in 2015 in a big paper to where, you know, there's, there's things out there for people to see if they're interested. And if they're not, you know, nothing lost, uh, find something else that you're interested in, and, but just, just keep reading and keep learning. Well, your website reminds me of Berkshire's website. So I think you're doing something right. Yeah, I, I'm hoping to improve it here soon. My emails blew up this last weekend and it's probably going to force me to actually hire a, an IT person. So the website will be part of that, I'm sure. Well, Max, <laughs> thanks again. Appreciate it. Yep. No, it was enjoyable. I hope we can do it again. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.